Okay, <clears throat> I think it is time to get started. Thank you all for joining this Fair Vote webinar titled Women Win with Ranked Choice Voting. We've got a terrific panel this afternoon. I'm really excited for this conversation. Now is an especially exciting time to have this discussion. We've got ranked choice voting elections coming up next month and this fall. Uh, next month, we'll see ranked choice voting elections in New York City and Arlington, Virginia. And then later this year in some of the biggest cities in Utah, New Mexico, Minnesota, and Colorado, we've seen women have historic wins in ranked choice contests in some of these cities, from the first majority female city council in New York City history to the first all-female city council in New Mexico's second largest city, Las Cruces. And so this webinar is the latest in our ongoing series. Uh, you can find the others, including discussions with leading experts in the election reform world on our YouTube channel, that's youtube.com slash fairvote, and our other channels, um, at fairvote on Twitter and fairvote reform on Facebook. My name is Deb Otis. I'm the Director of Research and Policy here at Fairvote. I will be your host this afternoon with the honor of putting the first questions to this distinguished group of panelists, but we want this to be a conversation and we're eager to include you as well. If you have questions, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A box. You can do this at any time. Don't feel like you need to wait until the Q&A section at the end if you think of a question. So let's meet our panelists. Uh, I am joined by three panelists today, all incredible women who have held elected office and been leaders in the ranked choice voting world. Uh, we are joined by Kelleen Potter. Kelleen is the executive director of the nonprofit Utah Ranked Choice Voting. Kelleen has had a successful career in government at the state and local level. She served as state director of elections in Utah and oversaw the implementation of the federal motor voter program in Utah. And more recently, she served on the city council and as mayor of Heber City, Utah. We're also joined by Joanna Bencomo. Joanna currently serves as the Las Cruces City Councilor for District 4, where she's focused her efforts on ensuring the city prioritizes anti-poverty efforts to improve quality of life. Um, Joanna has called Las Cruces home since she was 18 years old. She also works with a national organization, Women's Democracy Lab, serving as the program director for the Future Presidents Project, a fellowship program supporting Black women, Indigenous women, and women of color in elected office throughout the country. Last but not least, we are joined by Victoria Pelletier. Victoria is the National Partnerships Manager at Represent Women and is also currently serving her first term as a Portland City Councilor. She is the second Black woman in her city's history that has been elected to this seat. Um, that is Portland, Maine. Uh, prior to joining Represent Women, Victoria worked at Portland Empowered, amplifying the voices of racial and ethnic minorities as they influence policy change within Portland public schools. So thank you so much to all three of the panelists. Uh, really appreciate you being here and sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, I thought we'd kick it off with a question for everybody. So women make up a little over half the population, but as we know, only about one third of elected officials in this country. You have all run for and won elected office. So I wonder if you can speak about why you think that number is so low, uh, both based on your personal experience and what you might've heard from fellow women candidates and elected officials. Um, who would like to kick it off? I'm seeing Kelly in. I need to unmute. I'm happy to kick it off. I. Um, you know, there's some of the obvious reasons. Women tend to be the ones who are the primary um, caregivers for their children. And sometimes it feels like you're out doing Uber mom duties all evening. You couldn't possibly go to council meetings or things like that. But one of the things I learned early on in my um, career was women tend to think they have to know everything before they're willing to jump in. So when I was thinking about running for office, I thought, I don't know about roads and sewers and streets. And men tend to go, oh, I, I can figure that out. And so I think sometimes that tends to be a problem for women where they think they have to have 100% of the qualifications before they jump in and try. And so fewer women jump in and try. I can follow up with that. I completely agree too. That was that was me a little bit when I was wondering if I was going to campaign. I was like, I don't know what Robert's rules is. I don't, I'm not really sure what any of this means. So that was, you know, that was a really great point. And I think too, I mean, we can point to a lot of reasons, but I think speaking from a personal standpoint, um, government in all levels is not inclusive by design, especially local government. Um, in a lot of ways, it can be just a very unsupportive job and we're stretched really thin. We have to account for thousands and thousands of constituents as individuals with no staff um, because we don't have multi-member districts, at least in Portland. We're not paid uh, a living wage, which often leaves us with 
you know, people running from certain demographics and historically have, have been um, male, white, and closer to retirement age. Um, you know, and, and I think even like the time and the setting of meetings is very structured without a lot of flexibility for working moms or college students or service industry workers, which are the types of people that we want um, reflected in our local government. So I think like that's one aspect of it. And then the secondary one is there's there's also a safety aspect um, as well. And for me personally, with harassment, threats of violence, which women and women of color in office experience at a disproportionate rate. Um, so, you know, I think speaking to those kind of like human issues is, is a huge reason why we, we see really low numbers. And then I also think there's a, a system standpoint of a lack of ranked choice voting across the board for a lot of local and, and national elections that are allowing more women to have opportunities to actually get into these, um, into these arenas and be able to lead and to serve. Oh my God, goodness. Yes. I wouldn't even know what to add to that. Honestly, that's, that's right on. Um, you know, in Las Cruces uh, here in New Mexico on the third floor of, of city hall is the mayors and city council offices. And when you walk in, there's a wall of mayors of all the mayors that ever existed in Las Cruces. And it's all men, all men for just like a wall of men. And I think often we receive all of these external messages that we then internalize about whether these spaces are meant for us. And the reality is that they were not, right? That they were created not with us in mind, certainly not women of color in mind. And so I think we tend to internalize that we don't belong there. Um, and it's not until we surround ourselves with other women in programs like Emerge or Emily's List or all of these other uh, great candidate training programs that tell us, no, we absolutely do deserve to be there. We're great leaders. Um, and then I think, you know, once we get in, we talk to each other. And the reality is that this work is incredibly lonely. Um, it's scary in, in many circumstances. And, and they're not professionalized. So we're not paid well. So many of us have to have additional jobs in order to just be able to um, to survive, to pay our mortgages and rent and things like that, right? So I think it, um, I mean, you know, we don't tend to um, intentionally discourage other women to follow in our lead, but I think they they hear the stories of what we go through and think, I don't know if I should, right? Um, but that's why we have to change the environment uh, for us to be able to make this sustainable and to lead in a way that reflects our values. Thank you for those really thoughtful answers. Um, you know, we talked about some of the, the problems there. So let's pivot to a solution. You know, we're here today to talk about ranked choice voting. So I wonder if you could share what was your aha moment when that made you start believing in ranked choice voting? Um, should we kick this back to Joanna first? Oh my gosh, that's a great question. I, so in 2019, I, the first time I ran and it was the first time that the city would be using ranked choice voting. And for me, it was organizers sort of explaining to me that it was about this and it's really silly, but it was like, you don't really have to go in the ballot box and like plug your nose and then vote for like, I guess I'm going to vote for this person, right? Because I have to, it, ranked choice voting felt really value centered, which is like just the core of my leadership. And, and so for me, it was really that. And then um, when the women, there was four, there was three city council seats, just women swept those seats in that election. And then two years later, um, two more women um, came on the council. And now we have a six person, all women council. And, you know, there was some exit polling and, there was great feedback, particularly by younger people, that they said how much more they loved this kind of voting system that just solidified for me how much like access to the ballot box ranked choice voting is creating and ultimately something that I will continue to champion. Um, yeah, I think my like aha moment for ranked choice voting was probably the election of our former governor, Governor uh, Paula Page, who was a pretty polarizing character. People either really loved him or really disliked him. Uh, but in, that was kind of why we adopted ranked choice voting in Maine. Uh, for both his election and re-election, he won less than 50% of the vote. I think he was elected 
in his first term with 38% of the vote. And then in his second term, it was like 46, 47% of the vote. So the 50% threshold was never met. Um, and he had less than half of the state and was still able to serve two terms. And I, I think that there were a lot of conversations about a lot, you know, there's a lot to talk about in terms of like lack of option and being an incumbent um, and feeling apathetic about voting in general and, and all of that. But there was definitely a moment with that of everyone saying like, this is it. <laughs> This is what we're just going to continue to do for, you know, for the rest of our time. So I think the idea of being able to rank your candidates by preference and knowing that your vote actually counted and knowing that whoever won was truly reflective of the will of the voters um, was a really good conversation for a lot of us to have. But especially, I agree, younger people were, were very much into that idea of being able to rank your preferences, being able to open up the pool of candidates, and then knowing that whoever won the vote wasn't a wasted vote. We weren't limited to the best of two not great options. We could actually go through um, and rank. And that, that I think also allowed more individuals to feel like they had an opportunity to be involved in the conversation around running for, for seats, whether it was a governor seat um, or otherwise. So yeah, I think that was a, that was a big moment for, for us, I think as a whole in Maine, for people that were very pro ranked choice voting, when we saw that happen twice in a row with two campaigns of less than 50% of the vote. Um, and then just kind of saying like, this is not acceptable. So we're gonna have to figure something else out. And I think that's that led to us being able to have ranked choice voting, which is now a, a huge privilege, so. So for me, my first initial um, aha was it was so practical. I was the mayor and I thought we're going to save 50% of our election costs by cutting out a primary election, which often, like when I ran for mayor, there was a third candidate who um, the first time didn't didn't really do anything like often you get someone that puts their name in there but as a serious candidate you've got to double all your efforts to go through the whole primary season the whole general election and to me it made a lot more sense in a small community where everyone already knows who they're going to vote for to not spread out the campaign over that much time so financially it made sense um, municipal primaries are always the lowest turnout so I thought now we're having more people have a say in this election and narrowing it down if it's all done in the general election so it was primarily those practical reasons that initially was my aha this makes sense one more thing is we would often had candidates drop out after the ballots were printed so there were times when a candidate who had already dropped out got enough votes to change the outcome of an election and people who voted for that candidate not knowing they'd already dropped out their vote was wasted and they would have likely voted voted for someone else who ended up losing. And so to me, that was sort of an insurance policy that if something like that happened, those voters' um, preferences were also weighed in on the election and not just thrown out because their candidate had dropped out. That's great. Thank you to everyone. Um, let me pivot back to Victoria. So Victoria, you were first elected to the Portland, Maine City Council in 2021, um, although that was, I think, a two-candidate race, so ranked choice voting maybe didn't have as much of a direct impact in that campaign. Did the fact that Portland uses ranked choice impact your decision to run, and how do you think it's impacted your fellow city councilors and the way that the city council functions there? Um, yeah, it, so I don't know that it impacted me wanting to run for office personally, um, but my race was the only one where ranked choice voting wouldn't have played, uh, you know, a huge part because all of my running mates were all in multi-candidate races. So I think if anything, I just really enjoyed getting to watch it take shape while having conversations with people about how they would rank their ballot and also having opportunities in like debates and conversations um, to educate people who are still a little unfamiliar with how ranked choice voting worked. Um, and actually it, it ended up being really cool to see in action because in the at-large race, there were probably four or five candidates and there were two clear front runners. And a lot of people were like, I love them both. And it's great because I can rank this one first and this one second or otherwise, and just being able to have that was really cool. And, you know, they did a couple of things semi together, they didn't really join forces, but it was at least people being able to say, I'm going to rank this person one and this person two, and I feel really good about doing that. So having those conversations while I was campaigning, even though it didn't directly impact my race, was just really great to hear people's feedback about how they, you know, what they thought about ranked choice voting and getting to see it in action. And then uh, one of my favorite parts about my campaign was the education piece as well. 
um, because I, I had set up a table during my campaign right around Halloween. And I wanted to be really creative and bring people to my table to talk about politics. So I, I made a ranked choice voting ballot for people to rank their favorite Halloween candy. Um, and that was really fun because in doing it, I got to have really good conversations with people. I got to explain ranked choice voting. They got to have fun with it as well. Um, so I think that was great. And then just quickly in terms of impacting how the council functions, I think having proportional ranked choice voting in Portland just ensures that whoever we have serving in office is more reflective of the overall constituency. And that has helped because we currently have the most ethnically and racially diverse council we've ever had. And we are currently women led and the majority of those were multi-candidate races where ranked choice voting did have an impact. So I think it's just helped Portland be more informed in the elections, but it's also allowed you know, candidates and even people like me with no experience, who've never done any of this before, um, a fighting chance to actually get in the room of having that conversation. Amazing, thanks, Victoria. Um, I'd like to ask another question of Kellyanne um, and to uh, folks in the audience, please feel free to keep the questions coming, put them in the Q&A section and we will reserve uh, plenty of time to address those at the end. Um, so Kellyanne, you have been on both sides of, of this as you've been an elected official uh, and also an RCV advocate now that you're the leader of Utah Ranked Choice Voting. And so you, since you've kind of had that unique set of experiences being doing, doing both of those roles, um, why do you think this reform is so important in Utah? Well, along with the practical reasons that I mentioned earlier, when people ask me, why do I feel so strongly about this? There's one key thing for me. And I feel like, uh, you know, I also was a, a government professor for a time and I'm watching our country and watching the polarization and the negativity and the, it's just frightful to see what's happening in some areas of our country, how people are so all or nothing. You're, you're my enemy or you're my friend. And I feel like with ranked choice voting, it sort of retrains voters to look at candidates and say, yeah, I like this person the most, but this person is also really good on some issues that I like. And they have to try and sort, look a little deeper. And instead of assuming that everyone that wasn't your first choice is an enemy and that we need to undermine them and we need to say bad things about them, we can start looking at people and ranking them. And I think that trains voters to look at our system differently. I think it trains candidates to campaign differently. I know when I was campaigning, if I saw a sign for my opponent in someone's yard, I'm not going to stop there and try and convince them otherwise. I'm not going to go talk to groups of people that I know are going to favor my opponent. But in a ranked choice voting election, I'm going to try and find common ground. I'm going to try and find ways to collaborate and bring together 50% of the people in my jurisdiction to support me, whether it's first, second, third choice. And so I feel like it trains all of us to come out of this all or nothing negative cycle that we seem to be stuck in and start looking for common ground and collaboration and where do we agree? And I think it's so urgent and essential for our country right now that that's probably the biggest reason that I'm such a fan of ranked choice voting. Awesome. Um, let me pivot to Joanna with a question. Um, much of your work has focused on social justice and building power with historically excluded communities. How do you see ranked choice voting intersecting with that goal? Oh, it's, it, I mean, I think part of justice work is creating access to the ballot box. It's making sure that people understand their rights when they're in line. They make sure they understand where they can go vote. Um, in New Mexico, we have an incredible Secretary of State who has just um, led the way for incredible equitable access to the ballot box. And ranked choice voting is just part of that, I think. Um, as a community organizer, first and foremost, we understand that elections are just another tool to make change in our community. And when we have something like ranked choice voting, where um, people are excited about it, that, that you know, we have to continue building momentum around it. And I love uh, what Victoria and both Kelly were saying around the, the education piece that comes as um, a candidate, right, and being able to talk to people about the importance of ranked choice voting. All of my materials included a little pi picture of how the ballot would work. And so for me, it's just, you know, I think the more that people participate in our democracy, the stronger we are. And um, ranked choice voting has been such an incredible tool for people to feel excited about elections in the time where things are so divided. And when we talk about 
like national federal politics, that's even worse, right? And so when we bring it to the local level and we get to engage in conversations with people about the things that um, are impacting them in their every single day lives, that's, you know, that's the power of local politics and local government. It's why I love it so much. And um, I think ranked choice voting for me has just made elections um, just so much, um, maybe like gentler, or just more equitable and more open. And I think that's such an important thing. Uh, next up, let me ask, let's talk a little bit about the politics of getting this done. So this one's for Kellyanne. Um, in Utah, Utah is one of the first places where the push for ranked choice voting was largely driven by the state legislature initially instead of by voters. And it's also a heavily Republican state alongside some more liberal big cities and then purplish states like Maine and Alaska. And so why in Utah did elected officials want to pass ranked choice voting when they did? You know, interestingly, it started through our political parties and in using ranked choice voting in party conventions was a game changer. I remember as a delegate sitting in eight hour conventions and they, you know, you'd vote and then you'd wait for the count and then you'd go vote again. And so to be able to bring ranked choice voting to our party conventions and have um, legislators you know, elected officials, delegates say, wow, this was really great. It was practical. It helped us find consensus. That was where it started. And then we had what, who, the guy who was known as the most conservative member of the house and the woman who was known as the most liberal member came together to sponsor the legislation that got us our city opt-in program. So I think because of their advocacy and their experiences in the party conventions, they were able to come to the legislature and convince legislators that this makes a lot of sense. And, you know, there's been talk of using it in different elections, but the legislature said, okay, let's do it as a pilot in city elections first, and then we'll see how it goes in these cities and determine whether it will um, be used in, you know, maybe partisan primary elections in the future. You know, that um, it might be a segue into one of the questions that I saw come up in the Q&A. Um, this is a question about primaries. And so Kellyanne, you, you talked about how this initially came from the parties using it in conventions to get nominees. Um, in the Q&A, Linda has said, our primary system is broken. Um, people are afraid of getting primaried. How can we get our state and the US onto RCV for primaries? Um, does anyone want to weigh in on that? I'll just follow up briefly with what's happening in Utah. Um, you're, you're right. I mean, that's exactly the concern that we see here. And we also have the concern of other states where we're people getting elected. You know, in, in Utah, 80% of the elected officials are Republican. In most of these races, whoever wins the primary is going to win the general. And when you see candidates coming out with 30%, it's concerning. And so um, I think the most important thing is for citizens, our legislators, our city council members, they need to hear from people like you on this panel right now and those in the audience listening that we like this system. We, we They need to hear that this is something that we support as voters because as an elected official, you're always a little worried. You don't wanna be the person that does the thing that everyone hates. And so if they keep the status quo, there's not a lot of downside, but taking this leap and putting your sticking your neck out can be a little scarier. So I think the most important thing is for all of us as voters and citizens of this of our states and country to let our elected officials know that we want to see this in our jurisdictions in our future elections. Uh, Victoria or Yoana, anything to add there? Anything about RCV in primary elections? No, I don't know that I have a lot to add. I, I agree. I agree with, with feedback and I agree with constituents always, always, always sharing because and, and like staying engaged and really being part of those conversations, showing up to the meetings, um, staying engaged with, with campaigns and just making sure that like I... <laughs> I will always feel weird because I'm an elected official, but I'm like, don't let us off the hook. Like, bot, like you, you're supposed to bother us actually about like your ideas and like what you care about, what you're passionate about. Um, and when we're elected and or, or while we're campaigning, just don't lose that momentum and continue to have these conversations with us to push, you know, ideas around ranked choice voting. Um, because it, I think a lot of it is led with people power, and it's just really important that that people feel passionate enough to stay engaged. Um, because, you know, I, 
I was, if you would have told me that Maine would have been the first place that we, that would adopt ranked choice voting, we're not first for a lot of things. I feel like we're not like the trendsetters, like it's great to live here, but I never think of Maine as a trendsetting type of space. Um, and I, I think we set the tone with, with having ranked choice voting. And again, it's a huge privilege and I, I'm very thankful to have it, but also continuously surprised that we, that we have it here and that we were able to get that done. So yeah, I would just encourage people to continue to stay engaged um, and reach out to your stakeholders, reach out to your elected officials, and don't let um, this idea that you have or this hope that you have, um, you know, fall by the wayside. Well, Maine's a trendsetter now. <laughs> Um, Victoria, so in addition to your work on the Portland City Council, you also recently joined Represent Women as their National Partnerships Manager. Um, could you talk a little bit about the work that Represent Women does to increase women's representation? Yes, I would love to. So um, Represent Women it advances uh, women's representation and leadership uh, in the United States and abroad. So. With our research, uh, we work in tandem with partners to address the systemic barriers that women and especially women of color face while running for office um, and governing and hoping to address and dismantle those barriers so that we can have more women able to get into the door of the conversation um, and essentially run, win, serve, and lead. And so our research at Represent Women shows that women win with ranked choice voting um, and we put this research into the hands of our stakeholders and advocates and elected officials and community leaders in the hopes that, again, we can start the conversation around ranked choice voting and not lead with it as, because I think the common misconception I hear about ranked choice voting, especially here in Maine, for people that don't like it, is that it's like a very kind of progressive uh, agenda item and not a really important part of our democracy to ensure that the people we're electing are truly representative of our votes. So at Represent Women, we lead with what's called the twin track approach to achieve our goals, which is combining the efforts of women's representation organizations with systems work and electoral reform in the hopes that we can address and work towards um, dismantling the barriers that exist. So we are a women's representation organization, but we do have a presence in the system, systems world as well, which I really enjoy because I, I think that we are a lot of times in two really important worlds and really trying to make sure that we are creating a platform for these two types of organizations that are doing really important work um, and continuing to have conversations around how can we get more women in office and how can we ensure that they have the opportunity to actually serve? Because it's not that women aren't running for these seats. It's just that there are so many barriers that are existing that are stopping them. And a lot of them are systems-based. So yeah, it's a little bit about represent women. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, let me send it back over to Joanna. Um, you've been, uh, so in Las Cruces, the, it, Las Cruces has had ranked choice voting for two election cycles now. And so what impact do you think ranked choice voting has had over that time? Um, much like the title of this webinar that women win with RCV and so much to what Victoria was just saying is that we are honestly a perfect example of that. Four years ago, the city council did not look like this. Today, we have six women, um, majority women of color, city council. And I think in, I was reading through some of the questions and somebody said, nobody really explicitly talks about representation and why that matters. And something we used to say in organizing often was that um, the people closest to the struggle are the people closest to the solutions. And so should be the people closest to the power. And I think that um, having this true representation means that you're electing people that are like deeply, deeply in relationship with your community, with the struggles and the challenges of your of your neighborhood, of your district, of your city, and are acting in a way that is going to re represent you and, and uplift you and uplift those challenges and, and bring bold, innovative ideas without being scared of um, you know, retaliation, perhaps, I think that still happens. But um, I, I really feel like, you know, we're going into the third um, cycle this year, I'm up for reelection, two of my colleagues are and one of my colleagues who was on the city council is now running for mayor and potentially could become the first woman mayor of Las Cruces. And, um, and Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if she's the only woman on the ballot. And so I just it, I, I just think it, it 
our CV um, helps us be a little bit bolder about understanding how um, how the process works and understanding that you really do have a shot. And you ha- and if you talk to people and you know what, they have a number one, then you say, then I want to be your number two and that that's okay too, right? Um, and so I think it it has really, I, I think Las Cruces is a perfect example of why our CV is so important for women and for women of color. Awesome. Thank you. And you touched on, you know, one of the questions from the Q&A that I was hoping to pose to everyone also. Um, so thanks for lifting that up, Joanna. And I'd love to pivot that to uh, Victoria and Colleen. Um, the question from the Q&A, this comes from Katie. Uh, this question is, why does representation matter? Um, Katie says, I forget sometimes how important it is to talk explicitly about this question. Why should we care about electing more women and especially women of color? And what impact does that have on our democracy? Well, I'll jump in. Um, I can't say enough about how important it is to have the people who are making the decisions reflect the people who are being affected by those decisions. I found many times, I was also in a city where there was a whole wall full of pictures of men. I was the first woman to be elected mayor in my city. And there were many times when I found, you know, not every woman has the same opinion, not every man has the same opinion, but there are differences um, among, you know, different groups of people, different ethnicities, different, you know, genders. And it's so important that people who are making those decisions understand what it's like. Uh, you know, we, we've had a, a lot of issues with LGBT in our state. And, you know, I just think it's so important that the people making the decisions can understand the lived experiences of the people whose lives they're affecting. And I think that's why it matters. It's it's just, you know, we don't all have the same lived experiences. We don't all have the same challenges. And, and, and so we just need to have a combination of voices on all of our elected bodies that represent the people who are in those in those areas. I agree 100%. I also, everybody has a wall. It sounds like a wall, a wall of men in in your city hall. I like to wear like a really great outfit before the meetings and stand in front of the wall and have my picture taken because it's great. All the photos are in black and white. And then I'm wearing like all pink or something. And I like take a picture in front of it. So just passing that along, if that's something that both of you want to do. Um, But I, I completely agree. I think more more representation is better policy. More representation, I think, is, is you know, again, just providing the opportunity to even get into the room in the conversation. And I think if we're electing the same demographic of individuals, which, which historically we have done for years and years, we're going to have policy that is not going to be inclusive of our continuously changing environment. And we're not going to have policy that is recognizing I think the broader conversation around the fact that we have like a, a 1% and a 99% in terms of talking about being inclusive and, and, and being privileged. And I think if, if we're not electing women of color, then that's an entire group of individuals whose interests, and again, very different, but will never actually be reflected in the city's policy. And especially in a place like Portland, where we are rapidly diversifying, our city looks very diverse. And if we have a council that's filled entirely with men or white men, that doesn't really reflect the true Portland or the interests of the people of Portland that, that we um, you know, were elected to serve. So I, I completely agree that it's, it's, better, it's better policy. It's more inclusive of, uh, you know, I think what a lot of people who live here are hoping to see. And I think in, if if we're again going forward with with electing the same types of people, I, I just don't think that we're going to get anywhere in terms of being an equitable space and being a space where everybody can feel like they have a voice um, in the room of decisions. Can I add one thing to that? Um, we have a woman in Utah who's done a lot of research on the status of women and girls in Utah and has done uh, and shown there's so much data that shows when you bring all the voices together, you're more successful. Um, businesses are more successful. Government's more successful because you get all these ideas on the table and you come up with the best solutions and you have younger people who can look and say, hey, I can be anything I want. I think we we limit girls when they look at walls full of only white men and they look at legislatures full of only white men and say, oh, I could never do that. And we don't even know what we're missing out on. We don't know the beautiful and great 
great things they could have done had they thought, oh, I, they feel a passion for it and are shut down by it. So there's just so many reasons why we need to broaden and diversify our representation. Well, in your answers, several of you touched on accessibility and inclusion. Uh, let's talk about how that translates to the voter experience with the ballot. Uh, we got a question in the Q&A from Barbara. Um, one criticism that Barbara's heard of ranked choice voting is that it might be too complex for some voters to use. How does that match up with your experiences? I Something I always tell my campaign manager is that I trust voters. I think often we talk about voters like, um, one, they're not in the room, like we are all voters. And two, like, um, I don't know, like we talk about them, like they're not going to know enough. How do I, I think it's very derogatory and I want to place trust on the people, on my neighbors. And I think that's part of, I think the scary part is the change you've known how to vote in one way for decades, years, right? And now there's this change. And I think it's up to us as, as candidates, as incumbents to really talk to people about um, how simple it is, how exciting it is. And um, so I think it's, it's a huge part of our responsibility, not just leaving it up to advocates, but to us who are already in elected office or are running um, to take on that mantle of helping people I think it's less about not understand how complex it is and more about the fear of something new. Um, and so I think it's just about demystifying um, the, the process when in reality, ballots honestly have been complicated intentionally for a really long time. Like they've intentionally tried to exclude a lot of people with the kind of language that they use, right? And so I actually think ranked choice voting in many ways is, is working to, um, you know, to expand access and to expand um, an understanding of, of what it's like to participate in democracy. This is always a complaint or a concern that comes up when we're talking to cities about ranked choice voting. And I always say, people have known how to rank things since they were kindergarten. I want macaroni and cheese for lunch. If we don't have that, I'll take a hot dog. Like, as far as ranking things, there's, I think every human has had an experience with ranking. Now, we've also gone from flip phones to smartphones. I think that's a, a big complicated jump. There's so many things in our lives that we have to, there's a learning curve. And, I, and I'm totally aware that there is some learning curve with voting like this. However, the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center went to a middle school and they found not a problem with young people understanding it. One of our county clerks went to an assisted living center and they just gave the ballots to these older people and they didn't have an any higher error rate than they did in a typical election. Um, I think sometimes, because there are different uses of ranked choice voting and it is new and it's different, and but it's nothing that can't be understood by most people who are voting anyway. And that's what we found in our elections. There weren't any, you know, for the most part, it was about the same type of error rates that we would have in another election. It's just a matter of making sure people are aware what's happening. There's some instructions before the election, maybe with their ballot, um, but it's certainly something that people can understand. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I, I think, you know, there's definitely a, learning curve, um, like there would be with everything, but we are very intelligent humans. And uh, I agree, we have been choosing our favorite of something since we were kids. And so that is just ingrained in us to select our favorite of a thing. Um, that has been since since we were younger, I think that that's been something that that we've all been doing. So I think there's just a little bit of like resistance to change in general for anything. Um, but I you know, I agree with what was said. Ballots by design have always been really confusing. Like the way that things are worded is confusing. That's still happening, you know, here in local government. Proclamations are confusing with like the whereas and the this and like the it it's not it's not language that is digestible to um people who are not who didn't grow up in, in local government and who didn't grow up in politics. Like when I read a proclamation, I was like, I don't know what this means. This is a lot of words and it's not making sense to me. So you know, I I don't think that ballots have ever been like easy peasy. And I don't think that anything has ever been like a total breeze. And ranked choice voting by comparison is probably the easiest thing. I think that you'll do at a ballot because you were quite literally picking your favorite and ranking them one through whatever. Easiest thing, 
that I think all of us can do at a ballot in a long time. Um, you know, and I think again, it's 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 also practice, and that's why when I was campaigning, I did the ranking with the Halloween candy because I was like, let's get a refresher on how we do this. Like, pick your favorite, and there are tons of videos and how tos and blank ballots and samples. And I think you should be using ranked choice voting for actually everything that you do. Use it for like, where are you going on a family trip? That could be ranked choice voting. Where are you going to dinner tonight? That could be ranked choice voting if you're with a group. I just think using it in in your regular life and not just putting it aside for, you know, the once or twice a year that you vote, um, I think is also helpful. And again, would be reflective of what the majority wants and is a really great way to decide things in your own personal life. So if you are feeling a little bit nervous about it, I think just practicing and using it in the day, the day-to-day -day decisions that you make um, will help you feel a lot more prepared once you do go to the ballot. Awesome. Well, we've totally dispelled that myth then about it being complicated. So now that that's out of the way, uh, let's talk about persuading our elected official colleagues and actually getting this done. Um, so we got a question from Larry. Um, what are the panelists seeing in your state legislatures regarding uh, ex adopting or expanding ranked choice voting? And are there particular objections that you tend to hear from other elected officials? I, I definitely want to talk about this persuasion um, question for sure. I, I will say though that I think in Las Cruces, given that what the makeup of the council looks like, and then it's majority women, I sometimes I think people who run who are on the other side of the political spectrum say that there's a way for us to cheat and, um, and win over councils, which is just really funny to me, because I'm like, there's no secret sauce to this. I, you got to knock on doors. You got to knock. You got to talk to voters. Like that's how you win elections. Um, but one of the the things that persuasion, I think, um, when you compare, for example, Las Cruces and Albuquerque, Albuquerque and New Mexico being the biggest city in the state of New Mexico, and they do not have ranked choice voting. Every election cycle since I've been on count, the last two there have led to runoffs. And for people who are like fiscally responsible, who are, um, you know, want to see less public dollars spent on things, I cannot think of something more wasteful than a runoff election. They're incredibly expensive and um, disenfranchised voters, right? And so I, and often we already have low voter turnout, a, a runoff then has even less turnout. And so um, I think for me, that's one of the biggest pieces that I always talk to my colleagues in Albuquerque, like, what are you all doing? Like, this is so expensive. You <laughs> need to jump on the RCV train already. Um, and so I, I can't speak for legislatures, but certainly for councils who, who are having that problem. I think it's um, just sh sheer money alone, if that's what you care about. Runoffs are expensive. I can tell you, um, there have been legislators in Utah who have tried to bring ranked choice voting to partisan primaries, and that didn't go anywhere. Um, there are, I know there are some who still would like to see that, but um, I don't know. I don't know if it'll happen in the near future or not. There, obviously, you know, there's some differences in Republican states, and so um, it's sort the narrative has shifted a little bit, but it makes a lot of sense. Like we don't have runoffs. And so, like I said, um, whoever wins the Republican primary for governor for most of the federal offices, a lot of the legislative offices, statewide offices is going to, you know, pretty much likely win the general election. And we have people that can come through a convention process and a signature path. So you could have four, six, however many candidates for one of those offices and someone could conceivably win. Like last time we had a Congressman win with 31%, a governor with 37%. And so we call this our plurality problem in Utah. It makes so much sense. And I know that ranked choice voting is being talked about as one solution for that. And I expect that we will see that. It makes so much more sense than implementing runoff elections because states you know, like New Mexico that are already doing it are saying, you, your turnout decreases, you're spending a lot of money. It doesn't make sense. So I'm hoping that ultimately that's the solution that our Utah legislature will come to for, for some of these primary elections where you end up with candidates with a much less than a majority vote. Um, I'm seeing another question about 
whether ranked choice voting always replaces primaries or whether in some elections you keep a primary and a general with ranked choice voting. I wonder if the panelists could speak to your experiences about you know, the different types of RCV, whether it always replaces primaries. I can talk about Utah. So we just have a pilot project, which is just for cities. So most cities have chosen to just go to a general election and skip the primary. But we have one city this year who's decided to use ranked choice voting in a primary and then again in a general. Um, and in Utah, they have that option. It's just that a lot of cities prefer to skip the primary because they save the cost and the extra election. But um, some of the larger cities feel like they want to be able to let voters have two shots at it and it gives them more time to understand all the candidates. So that's how our system works um, in Utah. I don't know about other states. No, sorry, I don't have, um, <laughs> I admit that was weird. I don't have necessarily an answer to that because I my experience is only in municipal elections and our, our elections were already nonpartisan, so we didn't have primaries. Well, let's maybe talk about a thorny partisan question. Um, some, I think it, both Joanna and Colleen have mentioned in your previous answers, you've mentioned that par different parties or different sides of the aisle on this. Um, and so in the, in the Q&A, Blake has asked, um, Republicans seem to be opposed to these reforms. Uh, it, from my perspective, I think that's that's not universal. And we certainly are seeing, uh, say, state Republican parties and varieties of states embracing this. but there are some national figures who I think have some misconceptions and might be saying the wrong things about this. Um, I wonder how, if, if that matches up with your experiences on the ground and whether you believe there are arguments or angles that are be, will be particularly persuasive to people on either side of the aisle. I mean, for, for me, I think the, again, the thing I hear the most is that ranked choice voting is like only electing progressives or only electing, you know, like liberal left-leaning individuals, which I, has been made very clear in, in Maine that that's, that's not true. Um, I think there's a lot of dialogue to be had just around why, when a lot of people are just like, no ranked choice voting, I don't want to hear it. But just saying like, well, what, what don't you like about it? Like, what? Well, and I think like di just diving into that conversation opens it up a little bit more because a lot of times I think it's, it, the there there's no fact behind why someone doesn't like it other than like it's just been maybe planted that they shouldn't like it because it's looked at as a certain kind of like political tool rather than a very important part of our democracy so I always try and bring it back to why it's important regardless of what side of the aisle that you're on you should be able to rank your favorites and preference if you have two or three that you like you should be able to put them in order um, I think it also empowers us as voters to do more research before we go to the polls of who we you know who we align with regardless of what political party we, we are part of. Um, so that we can feel like we're making the best decision so that our second and third votes are going where we want them to go. So I don't, I, I try and take out, you know, like all of these really like hot button talking points that I feel like I hear in the world of ranked choice voting from just like social media buzz and just have a human to human conversation of saying, don't we want the person that is going to be most reflective of the will of the voters to be in that seat. Whether it's somebody that I like or not, I know that we went through with ranked choice voting and that was the candidate that got selected. And even if it was not my cup of tea, we still went through the process where every single person felt like their vote counted because it did. And I think, again, it just goes back to that strengthens our, our democracy and should make us feel more empowered as voters, whether you are a progressive or a conservative. And I think when I dial it back and have that type of conversation, um, it disarms people who I think have been very vehemently opposed to it and allows us to have a dialogue about what is best just standard for, for the democracy that we live in. So, yeah. Yeah. Excellent points. I think one of the reasons um, is just the nature of Republicans who are more conservative and more reluctant to change. And it's just no matter what change it is, wait, we've always done it this way. And the founding fathers did this. And so th those are some of the arguments I think I heard at a we, we had a booth at a Republican convention recently. 
I also know that on our board and in our state, there have been a lot of, re- I mean, it's the Republicans had to be pushing it or it wouldn't have happened. And one of them was a former state Republican chair. We have a lot of very um, committed Republicans who like ranked choice voting and believe that it is the best um, method for our state in different elections. I think that um, some people would argue that Virginia has a Republican governor because they used ranked choice voting in that party process and they were able to come up with the candidate who had the most consensus and, and was you know the most liked by the most voters. And so they were able to find someone who could win in that race. And I think that's something I bring up to Republicans sometimes who are reluctant. But we also have the same fears among some Republicans that it's going to elect more moderate candidates and not conservatives. Um, some people saw what happened in Alaska and they see it as, oh no, uh, you know, a Democrat was elected and it should have been a Republican, I'm out. And they, and they don't look much deeper at the dynamics of that race. Um, where truly the candidate who had the broadest and deepest support in that state won the election. And I agree that um, that is what we want. Some people just want what they see is best for their faction of the party. You know, we have a real conservative group in the party and they probably can't get a candidate elected with 50% because a more moderate Republican would probably be able to get 50%. So sometimes it's just because they can see that their people probably wouldn't get elected. I don't know, but we're, you know, we're always theorizing about what is it? What is it that people are opposed to and that they're not saying? Because sometimes the things they're saying aren't really adding up as far as it's too confusing. You, you know, we talked about that already. Maybe the count is, is a little more confusing than the vote, but most people can, you know, understand that. So we're always digging in, trying to figure out what is it that people really are opposed to and how can we address those concerns and make it so that it makes sense for everyone. I think this probably also goes to just like context within your community, your county, your state. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, my experience with conservatives on this is that what and I think we have to look at it on the larger context of what's happening around democracy and how conservatives there's so much of this narrative around um, voter fraud and like all of this misinformation and disinformation um, that is happening that I think something like choice voting for many on the further left, I think only see as another um, conspiracy theory against them and their candidates. And so I think it, for me, it's a little bit of a harder conversation because I think um, there are some people to me that I just, it would take a lot of energy, a lot of emotional labor to try to persuade anybody. But I do think that for the folks that are just like, this is just a lot of change and I don't understand it. Like that's a different perspective, I think. Um, unfortunately, I, I just happen to encounter a lot less of those folks. Um, in New Mexico, I think where we've really swung left from, I mean, our state legislature, our governor here in um, Las Cruces, or the majority of the council is, if not pretty left, is moderate left. Um, we don't have a conservative elected to the city council. And so I think they see it and they say, see, we can't win. When the reality is I could go in and analyze your campaign and just tell you that you're not talking to enough voters, that you're not persuading voters at the door about the things that they care about. Now, um, this is a, a reality about values alignment and not the tool in which we are using to elect people, right? And so um, I just, so it it's a little bit of a tougher question, I think, because the realities that we're facing around um, protecting our democracy are pretty real and scary. Well said. Uh, we are coming up towards the end of the hour here. I think we will do just one more question. Uh, we got a New Mexico specific question in the chat. So let me throw this to Joanna. Um, Sila asks, New Mexico constitution allows for municipalities to adopt ranked choice voting. How can we encourage other cities to adopt RCV throughout New Mexico? So I'd love for Joanna to take this and then also throw it to the other panelists for your own states. Oh my gosh, Sila, if you are in New Mexico, I'd love to hear from you. I think 
Um, they'll share our contact information and, and our, I think social media handle. So reach out for sure. I would love to talk about this. I think as elected officials, as municipal lo local elected officials, we don't organize ourselves in New Mexico. I think we're so disconnected from each other. Um, like I hardly know people in Taos or Farmington who are elected to local office. And I would really like to change that. And I think there's a huge opportunity if there are any um, if, I know there are organizers, advocates in New Mexico who are fighting to bring more RCV to more cities, um, that if they organized more elected officials to have these conversations here locally, I think that that could go a really, really long way as opposed to trying to do it isolated um, within your community and really, you know, um, so yeah, organizing, organizing, but particularly organizing those of us who are already in elected office. Um, we're just deeply disconnected, and I would love to see that change. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. Organizing a thousand percent is how everything essentially gets done, whether it's on the ground or whether it is in the, the halls of, of local government. And I think when both of those things can combine together, it can be very powerful. So you know, here we had some really amazing and still do grassroots advocates that were working towards change and systems change and are continuously advocating for the things that they think that we should have um, here in, in Portland and in Maine, ranked choice voting was one of those. And that was a lot of conversations, but definitely organizing the elected officials that again, work work for you as public servants um, and have those conversations and, and continue to, to, to organize collectively with, you know, different different groups in order to, to try and promote and make change. So yeah, I would just say, continue pushing the conversation, don't let it get lost. Um, and eventually I think a lot of movement can be made. And I think it will, I feel like we're, we're getting there slowly in terms of that conversation around more individuals and, and more municipalities and states having ranked choice voting. It's just, you know, it's gonna be a little bit slow going, but I actually think that we, we will get there. We're a lot further than I actually thought we would be. So that's good. One of the things we do at Utah Ranked Choice Voting is just to help in that education process. So when a city council is considering using ranked choice voting, we've often done presentations. But to me, I think the thing that really pushes the needle is just hearing from their voters, hearing from their constituents. And if they hear from four or five people that don't like it, you know, most of the cities in Utah that are smaller, you just don't hear from a lot of people on a lot of issues. And I know having been mayor and city council, if you hear from five or 10 people, it seems like a lot of people care. So to be able to just speak up and whether it's a personal conversation or an email or something, just letting them know that there are people in my community that support this. And it kind of gives them cover so that when they do it, they say, hey, you know, a lot of citizens wanted to do this. So we said we would try it. And I just think that's the most important thing is just getting those voices out and letting them, the, these people making the decisions know that you care, that you like it. I mean, they got elected under the existing system. So there's not a lot of motivation for them to change it. And so you got to kind of push it a little harder to say, we want you to change the thing that got you elected and take a risk on something different. So you got to make sure that they hear from citizens in their constituencies that like it and want to try it. Well, thank you so much. I am going to wrap this thing up. Uh, panelists, I cannot tell you how wonderful this conversation has been and how much we really appreciate you being here. So thank you, Joanna, Victoria, Kellyanne. This has been great. A um, couple of housekeeping items, and then we'll let everyone sign off. Um, a few of the panelists have shared their uh, social media info so that you can follow them and be in touch. Uh, you can find Joanna on Insta at joanna 4 lc and on Twitter at Joanna underscore Nayeli, that's underscore N-A-Y-E-L-L-Y. -L -L -Y. Uh, you can find Victoria on Insta at Counselor Victoria. Um, so take them up on their offer to be in touch with elected officials. Um, and thank you to everyone who signed in and joined us for this last hour to talk about how women win with ranked choice voting. Uh, we do plan to post this video on our YouTube and social channels in the coming days, so you can look out for that if you need to uh, check in again, get any of these amazing quotes that our panelists had today. And feel free to share with anyone who might be interested and might have missed it. Uh, and then, of course, keep an eye out for invitations to future webinars from Fair Vote, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you again. Have a great day.